Okay. All right, we are live there. So for our, our group, our group is growing. So we're here today talking about Lyme disease with Cindy Kennedy. I'm going to introduce her in a, in a minute. The best place to leave questions is in the chat. And if you wouldn't mind selecting all panelists and attendees, we're just getting started, but you're welcome to like start posting questions now. If you know you already have questions about Lyme, we're happy to get your actual questions answered. So Cindy Kennedy is a family nurse practitioner that practice fun practices functional medicine in order to get to the root cause of illnesses. She left a thriving gynecology practice after realizing mainstream medicine focus does not ask why the person is having symptoms. Cindy struggles with, has struggled with chronic illness for years until being diagnosed with Lyme and mold illnesses. Her focus is now is to offer a functional and integrative approach to healing. So first of all, welcome, Cindy. Thank you, thank you. It's so nice, so nice to be on the other end of the microphone. It's fun to be interviewed as well, yeah. So you, know, you are much more of an expert on Lyme than I am, and I want to pretty much focus on that, but I'd love for you to tell a little bit more about your story. It sounds like you got into functional medicine from your own mystery illness. How did you find out that you had Lyme and mold? Well, it took forever. It, it really did. And, you know, unfortunately, I practiced uh, allopathic Western medicine, and I didn't even know what was wrong. And it just took a lot of people and a lot of time and a lot of money and lots of I don't know and whatever and I finally finally just happened into a functional medicine practice that really helped me right. and diagnosed me yeah through through a non-traditional Lyme test which is so so important if you get a negative test and you still believe that you are infected it's really important to find that practitioner that will send uh, your blood out to uh, a specialty lab. And that's how it happened. And then it was the whole process of going through antibiotics and then having a huge allergic reaction and saying, I've had enough of this, and then going on to, to herbal remedies. And mm. at the very end, I had gotten much better, but not completely. And I worked in my gynecologic career in an office that had a lot of water damage. And then of course, learning all about this, I was amazed. And I said, I get a test and lo and behold, had a lot of mycotoxins and started treatment for that. And then I was like, oh my God, I hadn't remembered how well, well feels. It took a long, long time. And I'm talking, you know, somewhere around eight years of my life was really a disaster. It's unfortunate. But now having experienced all that and realizing I don't want anyone to go through that. I don't care what your issue is. If you're not happy with that issue, uh, you're not satisfied with your treatment, you've got to find somebody who can really look at you in a different way in an individualized way, because two people can have the same issue, but you really can't take care of them that same way. So I just... I, we need more of this because mainstream medicine is pretty much focusing on putting out fires. That's all they can do. Yeah, I, I had an appointment today and they asked what I did. And I was like, well, I have this online business. I sell supplements and labs. And like, I'm basically giving people access to, you know, things that they, they can't get in their doctor's office to get answers. And I had never really described it like that. And she's like, oh, and I'm like, yeah, it is pretty exciting. And, you know, does it suck that like, it's not, you know, I don't know, maybe you can take some insurance with your thing, but like, I, I can't take any insurance. And I, I know it sucks, but I've also been on your end. I've been the patient who had to pay for all this stuff out of pocket and on my HSA card. I mean, it's, you know, we can't wait for the system to catch up. It, I don't know if it'll ever catch up. So we have to just, you know, invest in that, um, you know, instead of buying a new car or whatever. I know, <laughs> I know you have so. to make choices. You really have to make choices. I don't take insurance because if I took insurance, I could not take care of the people the way I need to in, right. in terms of this functional approach. I need to spend a lot of time with people. And if I... In my other practice, if we build out, say, $100, we would get $51. So if you can imagine, you know, everybody thinks physicians and nurse practitioners in, in these busy practices are making, you know, no. a lot of mm -hmm. money. They are 
really not. No, we're getting nickel and dimed by the insurance companies. It, well, the patients are and the practitioners are. So for me, I'm spending an hour and a half to close to two hours with an initial visit. And back in the day, I would have had to see about six patients for an hour and a half. Yeah. You know I mean? Yeah. Yeah. You know, no, you can't do it this kind of medicine. No, no yeah. you really have to do a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of hand holding. I, you know, the, the biggest thing that my husband and I felt every time we went to a new person for help, we would be like, damn, this is the one. This is going to help us. This is it. And we went in for the second visit and it was like such a letdown. People were, mm, yeah. not, you know, it looked like everybody was gung ho and they were really going to find the difference and it, it didn't happen. So that's what my, my big mission is, is to make a difference. That's awesome. Yeah, Lyme is uh, labeled as the great imitator. So people can look like they have fibromyalgia. People can look like they have chronic fatigue. People can look like they have rheumatoid arthritis or MS. It's, it's incredible what avenues this type of uh, illness can take people down. It's, it can be a really big rabbit hole. And especially because, as I mentioned, the current lab testing that's available through your regular labs in your area are very, very non-sensitive and inaccurate. And people don't understand that. And what's even right. more is your doctor doesn't understand that either. Yeah. I want to get into the labs and get really specific, but yeah, let's talk more about the symptoms and why it takes people so long to be diagnosed. I'm curious too, like, are there certain things like, oh, everyone thinks they have people tend to think they have hypothyroid or people tend to think they have rheumatoid arthritis, or is it just all over the map? Exactly. Uh, it's all, all over. over the map. Okay. You, you map, not the mat, <laughs> the map. Um, because people can show up with, you know, just, I, I think most people have horrific exhaustion. I think that's one of the big things is a really bad okay. fatigue. Some people can show up with really bad headaches. People who have uh, the associated infections, which are also called co-infections, uh, ticks can bring about, you know, not only Lyme disease, but Babesia, Bartonella, or Lichiosis, Anaplasma, certain viruses. So it can be So you could be feeling like some viral stuff oh, or flu kind of, symptoms, okay. swollen glands. And, you know, when it wreaks havoc in the immune system, it can bring up other things. So if somebody had, say they had mono when they were a kid and all of a sudden they're just seems like they're sore, sore throats coming back and their glands, you're going to have reactivations of viruses that are stay in your system. So it, in general, people do not feel well and they, you know, in the beginning might say, gee, I think I might have a little something. And then days and weeks go by and they're not getting better. They might be getting worse. Not everyone has painful joints. For me, it was my fingers and my wrists, which that didn't go with what the textbook says. The textbook says knees and not everybody has swollen. I didn't know that it had knees. so much like joint stuff. That's interesting. Is that because the um, like inflammation is collecting in the fluids and stuff? Is that yeah, it can okay. be any of that because let's let's take it from the bite phase. Ticks carry the Borrelia, and there's all different species of Borrelia depending on where you live. So there are certain species that come from Europe. There are certain species that are out in California that we don't necessarily have here in New England. But if someone from New England was carrying a tick on them and they flew out to California mm. oh, wow. and deposited that tick out there, I mean, it is, it's outrageous. The birds carry, carry them. Um, so if, if, you're, if you're considering the fact that you may have an issue, it, it really is important to bring that to your doctor's or nurse practitioner's attention. But um, in general, the, the symptomatology can be completely different and crazy. And when you get the lab tests, they're looking for antibodies. And the problem with everyone's immune system is that they may not secrete those antibodies or produce those antibodies. So stepping back and going to the superficial, 
um, the bite, the uh, tick carries the Borrelia within their, their GI, their stomach. So they have to latch on. And what they actually do is they find a source of blood because that's what they need. They need that blood meal and they bring that blood in and then it, it fills their gut. And so what they have the ability to do is to more solidify that meal by spewing back the liquid. When they spew mm. back the liquid and the Borrelia is in their GI tract, their stomach, that's what gets deposited right into, you know, and underneath the surface. And that's a bacteria, the, the Borrelia is a bacteria. It is a bacteria, okay. but it's smart. It's stealth <laughs> and it's deceptive. So it's not like, you know, you get a bacterial pneumonia and you get some antibiotics and, you know, the pneumonia, you know, houses that, that certain amount of bacteria right in that one cluster, you know, it can spread in the tissue, but Borrelia is different. So very rarely, I'm going to say less than 50%, less than 40%, do people get that bullseye. And okay. when you get that bullseye, you should have no testing. You should not pass go. Don't collect $200. You need the, the antibiotics. And the problem is we're seeing that the, the, the people who are making these, uh, these decisions are saying we need less and less and less antibiotics. And so I think they're- Ooh, Conventional doctors? Yeah. Or, yeah. Really? The I'm CDC, surprised. the CDC, you know, people who- been active in this Lyme community know that you need, you really should at the minimum is three. If you can get four weeks, even better of doxycycline, which is the most common. Some people need um, a, a different type because they're allergic to tetracycline. So, you know, depending on what your particular uh, allergies are, it can be other medications. But, you know, say you got a bite and you never got the bullseye. And so you really didn't know. And then all of a sudden, that is going to migrate and disseminate. So you've got a local, and then you go to an early dissemination, which still people aren't necessarily having any symptoms. It's not until it becomes invasive. And these little devils go into the bloodstream, they go everywhere and they set up their home and it can be in an organ, it can be in the tissue, it can be in the joints. It's can be in the brain. Uh, neuroborreliosis is, is awful. It's such a so bad awful. thing. Yeah. I mean, you can get lost. You can just be confused. It's, it's terrible. But the most important part of this silly little creature is that it changes forms. So when we think about a pneumonia, pneumonias pretty much stay. That's their form. But Borrelia changes forms it can turn into a cyst form. It can house itself in what's called a biofilm. Plaque on your teeth is basically a biofilm. Right. Okay. So it houses this. So when that happens, the antibiotics may not get in and work. And the replication, the cycle of the Lyme growing is very, very slow. And that's why that short-term course of antibiotics may not be enough. So what my thoughts are. Um, and again, a lot of these things that uh, we're looking at may not be 100% researched, but I can tell you that in terms of naturopathic care, this is what they really rely on and moving people right off those antibiotics or even while on antibiotics into a really good herbal approach. And there are several types of herbal approaches and depending on who you find that will care for you, um, that is a really good option. And some people need three months, six months, a year, but the good news is it's not toxic. It's not going to disrupt your gut flora, which antibiotics okay. tend to so the really, herbals, are they antibacterial herbals? They can be antibacterial. They be combination of antibacterial and antiviral, but it's also okay. immune support. You know, we're looking at all of those, those things and, and practicing, you know, good gut health with, you know, either probiotics or making sure that we have binders on board so we can get rid of these toxins. There's a, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of types out there. And a lot of people have tried to work themselves through 
with something that they can get like Dr. Cowden's protocol or looking at things from Steven Buhner. And, you know, there's, there's a variety. Um, sometimes it really means you really should be with a practitioner that can say, okay, yeah, we're getting better. We're not getting better. It's been two months. You've seen no improvement. We really need to move off of this and into something else. I mean, you know, somewhere around 70% of your immune status comes from the gut. That's called your GALT, G-A-L-T, your gut associated lymphoid tissue. You're, you're going like this, so you know <laughs> that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, in your gut, you make about 80% of your serotonin, which is your uh, a, a very important neurotransmitter to keeping your mood in a good place. So if you're destroying all that, you know, that's gonna leave you a bit washed out. Yeah. Yeah. You do have to balance it. I, I'm just going to interview this virologist on Monday. And he was saying, because I asked him a question beforehand. I'm like, you know, we sell some antibacterial herbs and some of the companies are like, no, it won't kill your good friendly bacteria. And we always get that question. He's like, oh yeah, it's going to kill friendly bacteria too. So you have to be judicious with how you use it. And I think that's why you're talking about the probiotics and binders and working with a practitioner because you don't you don't just want to be on antibacterials forever. Um, and as he was pointing out, like things can start developing resistance to herbals too. So if we're all getting on the bandwagon with herbals, that's great in a sense, but if we're abusing them, things could get resistant to herbals, which is like not what we want, you know, as, as yeah. the kind of world climate yeah. is kind of changing with, I think it's going to keep changing with, pandemics and stuff and like we don't want to create that it's kind of a separate issue but I think it's interesting because it's a little more big picture it is and uh it it seems to be getting more and more complicated I I don't remember any of this I used to play in the woods as a kid all the time I don't have any clue of ever learning or hearing about this I think you know a spider bite was probably the only thing I knew of when I was growing up and now you know our kids we have to get them in and we've got to try to bathe them all the time. We've got to, you know, lift up all places where the mm. sun don't shine and, you know, look for these, these ticks. And remember people, a tick in its nymph stage is probably the size of a poppy seed. Oh, wow. So, yes. Yes. They're very, very, very tiny. And for, uh, for a tick to move from one stage to another, you know, first their little eggs and then they get into nymphs and then from, from nymphs to adult, they have to have a blood meal. So it's kind oh. of not like, oh, they feed on the grass. They have to have a blood meal. So they're always in search of a rodent, a rabbit, a bird, the deer, you know, they're, it does, they're not very specific. They don't care what they're chewing on. They, that's what they want. And that's the only place they'll go. They live about one to two years. Uh, males are only intended to procreate. <laughs> And then they die. <laughs> oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Wait, did you say one to two years? Yeah, one to two years. Of That's their a long lifespan. time. Yeah, sure is. For sure a is. bug, or I don't know if you call it a bug. A parasite? Yeah, well, it's an insect. It? It's, um, yeah. Huh. I don't, I, it's not a parasite. It, it, you know, it's, it's definitely an insect. Okay. Remember? But there's different species and I'm blanking on the name of it. Oh, that's okay. It reminds me of the show I just watched. <laughs> on HBO <laughs> and this person needed a blood meal <laughs> to keep living. So you keep saying that I'm like, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess, I guess, show. yeah, yeah. You needed the blood meal. Um, I know. <laughs> so Dana asked a question and I kind of had a similar question about myself. She, she said she struggled with health issues forever. She recently remembered having a classic bullseye bite when she was around 10. She never got antibiotics for it, but did get other antibiotics you know, over the course of the years for strep throat and stuff, she was wondering about verification and her mom had a, a bite with no mark. Um, so yeah, maybe a good time to talk a little bit about testing and can you be, if, if you don't remember a bullseye, that's kind of was my question. I, I Do you know where Lemonster, Massachusetts is? I do. I, I lived there do. when I was a kid. We had a ton of ticks. I don't oh, sure. remember any bites. But I wonder in my own case, like if now that I've been exposed to mold and so like, I wonder if things can kind of like activate later on. It can, 
Yeah, you know, it's funny because when I take a health history, I go from literally their birth, their mom's prenatal care and uh, prenatal, prenatal history, and then I go all the way through. And it's almost, it's almost a given that as soon as somebody started not feeling well, there was some sort of trauma just shortly before. And it can be any type of trauma, where is a loss, um, a sudden state of, you know, uh, a lengthy time of stress. It can be a, a surgery. It can, it can be anything that causes the body to be stressed and then your immune system drops and it can allow this dormant um, Borrelia or, uh, you know, people get shingles. Sometimes it's been a dormant virus because you've had chicken pox. Those kind of things happen. So it, it's not necessary to have an immediate response. So someone who had a problem when they were a child and, you know, a bite that they remember, well, fortunately, there are people that are able to combat it themselves because they have a really good immune mm, system. Okay. And, and think about that. Think about, think about all the landscapers out there, people who are, you know, knee deep in tall grass. And why are, why aren't every landscaper that's out there sick? And we don't have an answer to that. We don't know what they have in their immune system that helps fight it. You know, I wish we could figure that out, but someone who, has had a history, hasn't necessarily been treated appropriately. That's the terminology. Depending on what someone got for antibiotics for strep throat was probably a seven to 10 day course. Could it have helped? Depends on the antibiotic and you know who knows if you had a ramped up immune system, you know, maybe. But someone who has ongoing symptomatology they have ongoing issues and you know they wax they wane they're on one side they're on the other side of the body they just never seem to be feeling well then it might be time to look at the antibody panel and um, a lot of people uh, use Igenix. Uh, they're a company in California and they they're it's very expensive you can spend you could spend as little as maybe about $500 looking at some basic stuff. But then if you go further and you really need to be more specific, you could spend a couple of grand trying to do that. So there these are, are Lyme co-infections or is more for, than that? For everything, for everything. Okay. You can, and it's, uh, unfortunately, it's a menu. The only time I like to see a menu is when I'm in a restaurant. I really hate to see the menu when you are picking out lab tests for patients like this because- it, it can run very, very, very high. Um, there's another company that I like, uh, it's called Vibrant Labs, and you can get a, an enormous amount of testing. They just use a different type of testing and it's somewhere around $500. So okay. there's a big difference. But again, Igenix is, is one of the biggest names when it comes to uh, Lyme testing. Do you think that one is more accurate than the other? You know, they, I don't think that there are head to head studies from okay. one to the next. So Just it's hard to say. Claim, marketing claims. Okay. Yeah. When I have a patient that is first coming to me, I might just send them for regular lab testing because if I come up with something, I didn't have to, you know, have them spend out of pocket money. If I don't, and we're really not coming up with their, their panel of, of blood work to show why they're feeling that way, then we have the choice of either treating anecdotally because it seems like it, or if they can't afford to do more testing. Um, another lab that's out of Germany is called Armin Labs. Now they, I'm actually on my podcast, Living with Lyme, uh, I will be interviewing him shortly, and I'm going to find out a little bit more about their testing because I, as I understand it, their testing is able to determine if there is anything left in the blood that they drew um, for that test. So that can actually see how well someone has done on their protocol, whatever the protocol was. Mm. So if that's the case, 
that's a great option for somebody who has gone through treatment, doesn't know if they have anything left, or maybe it's been a long time and they have not been able to ever get tested. You know, it, it depends on that person. And it's unfortunate that it pushes someone to spend a lot of money and it's, and it's yeah. anxiety provoking. And now we know there's that we moms can actually pass this through their placenta onto mm. the baby. You can have youngsters that are teeny tiny babies or whole families that have Lyme disease. And then I always look at people who have been treated and still not feeling well. And in my mind, and really this intuition that I have is they just have chronic inflammatory leftover collateral damage. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes you have to step back and find out where is that coming from? And you have to look at the pillars. You have to look at the sleep, the emotional stress, the nutrition. You have to look at, you know, being mindful and being aware and being present. Um, and, you know, that whole detoxification, are you pooping? We have to talk about poop all the time. So, you know, it it's a bigger thing than just wham, bam, treat it and they'll get better. You really have to take that person apart piece by piece and try to put them back together. You know, somebody who's not drinking enough water, something as simple as that. Some people do really well if you alkalinize their body. I have everybody start with a nice warm cup of water uh, with lemon in it in the morning and try to have that and then wait and try to eat and then have their coffee or their tea a little bit later. So you're not in right away acidifying the cells. True. Yeah. Okay. That's a good tip. Yeah. D Dana, maybe you can talk a little bit more about your symptoms if you want to share and we can use you as a little bit of a, a case study. You know, and one thing I say when we talk about spending money, but most of our followers, um, they're already living a healthy life. But like you said, you can always look, look, look around at your blind spots you know, clean up your diet a little more. And I feel like if you're doing the basic things and things are still like sideways, you know, or Dana, you've tried a lot of stuff and it's not getting better. Um, yeah, maybe it's time to test. We have an account with that Vibrant Lab. So that's possibly something, you know, we'll offer in the future. Um, I've been wanting to test too, because I know, you know, I don't remember any tick bite, but I just have so much of the co-infections with the mold and the I have Epstein Barr for sure and Hashimoto's and like, I'm pretty well managed, but you know, I, I do also wonder like, is there something I'm missing that's keeping me from fully recovering? Um, I think some people have proposed even, you know, trying some of the tinctures for Borrelia or the different Bartonella and just see whatever you respond to it. Do you have like a Perks response or something? Right. Well, that? and you know, some people are very fortunate and they really don't have the Herx response. Antibiotics do cause a bigger die off. Oh, but two of the best things um, are, well, a a Andrographis is great for viral stuff. Right now, you're not going to be able to find it because everybody's trying to take it for the coronavirus, which we can chat about in a little bit. But Japanese knotweed and cat's claw. Um, those are two foundations that uh, Dr. He's not actually a doctor. He's an herbalist. Stephen Buhner is uh, that's those are those are his two foundation. Um, what was the what was with the cat's claw? Uh, cat's claw and Japanese knotweed. Japanese knotweed. OK, one formula that is comprehensive and does not break the bank is called return healthy. Hmm. Return Healthy comes from Dr. Werner Vosloo, and he is in Utah, um, probably one of the nicest guys as a doctor that I've met. He's a naturopath, and he found that his patients were stopping treatment because they couldn't afford all of the, the sure. medications, the herbs, etc. And so he found a way to package a, a plan which is called the foundation formula. And it has uh, the main bottle is the cat's claw and the Japanese knotweed. And then he incorporates stuff for binders, for immune support, for gut health. 
and it's somewhere let's see um maybe maybe a couple hundred dollars a month okay so like and when you think about that plan. and you're getting all of that in one kind of package it makes it nice because you know some of the other protocols there might be 12 bottles true and certain things that you have to take at certain times a day and never before one and never after one and in here and okay and it gets crazy and you get confused and let me tell you if you are about a, i'm going to tell you i know i've heard this that it's a hundred percent but i'll go with 90 percent of people that have chronic infections they just can't sleep right and especially if you've got you've got Lyme in the brain. Now, now think about mm -hmm. kids. I, I do want to bring up children because children are tiny. And when ticks get on them for you and I walking through and brushing against grass or something, it might be on our shin level, but, but littler ones, it might be on the hip or the waist and those little guys crawl and it's not so far up their head. So a kid who gets a tick bite in the back of their ear or, you know, in the back of their head or in their scalp, you're more likely to get neurologic symptoms. So children may, and they don't know, they don't have a point of reference for what well is, you know, especially if they're really just starting to talk or, you know, they're, they're still young, um, but they'll start having behavioral issues. They may start having obsessive compulsive stuff, uh, sudden onset of learning issues or really kind of that behavioral problems. Like all of a sudden you get a call from Johnny's teacher saying, I can't keep Johnny in his seat. He's never been like this before. And those kind of things kind of stick out because kids do get that neurologic component where sometimes adults, it takes a while. Okay. So Dana wrote in and said that some of her other things went on are Hashimoto's, SIBO, depression, and she said sore throats and lymph, swollen lymph since age 12. So kind of around the same time as this. Is this a like a kind of a kind of client you would potentially come in and is this <laughs> is, typical? This is what we see, you know, we do see. Now, can she tell us where she's from? Uh, yeah, Dana, you can, can you write in where you're from? She said after the tick bite, she had pain and brain fog, depression and fatigue. Yeah, so yeah I'll have her write yeah. in. Oh, she's in British Columbia. Ah, yep. Um, it's hard. I, I know that Canada is a, a real hard place to get to get care. Um, but if she's close to the U.S. border, uh, there's some really great people up in that neck of the woods. Because um, it's a blood lab that you have to draw. And you know what people can, can um, kids can get sent out of the country, um, I believe. So there, there is always a possibility to even um, find out if someone does a teleconferencing yeah um, do you do teleconferencing by the way I, I do but for me to legally do it i only have a license in massachusetts and connecticut so you prefer uh, come people come one time kind of a thing well absolutely that would okay. that's the right way to do it so british okay. columbia um is a, is a little bit far um however if um one of the things that she may want to look up is lymedisease.org org and that is probably the best database of resources that anybody can can have so okay. she may be able to find someone really easily um or if she has a private plane and she wants to come this way we can <laughs> set her up <laughs> oh you never you know sometimes people have family somewhere else so they go there anyway so honestly honestly yeah. but there i you know if she needs something more um my i have you've got your podcast so that's yeah that podcast more. living with lime and that's living with lime dot ck at gmail.com um that's particularly that's for that or my pursue p-u-r-s-u-e wellness dot ck at gmail.com uh either one you can email me and if i can help i'd love to help I just, I don't want anybody to ever suffer the way I did. It was, it was brutal. 
Yeah. So you mentioned eight years. Was that eight years sick or eight years trying to heal? Eight years sick. About uh, at least. I'm trying to remember. Let's see. Um, maybe a good five. Not diagnosed. Okay. And then finally, you know, I mean, <laughs> it's awful, but I was arguing with a primary care and all she said is, well, all I can do is give you three weeks of doxycycline. And I'm like, bring it on. And at the end of the three weeks, she sent me over to a rheumatologist and I said to him, and of course I didn't know any better. And I said to him, oh my God, I'm about 75% better. And he just shrugged his shoulders and said, I don't know why. And that is like wrong because think about it. You have pneumonia. You go to the doctor. They say you have pneumonia. They give you your treatment and they say, I want to see you back in two weeks, right before your treatment is over. And you show up and you're like, gosh, I'm almost there. I feel better. You know what they're going to do? They're going to write you a script for about another seven to 10 days more. Mm. You know, to me, you're on a treatment, you're getting better. It really isn't a coincidence. And at that time, I know that if I got another round of antibiotics, I would have never been in that situation. And then again, I never would be in a new office, treating people, adjunct care, integrative practice. It would <laughs> never have happened. And you know what? You probably wouldn't be in the situation you're in right now, right. helping other people if you didn't go through it. It's unfortunate, but that's what happens. Yeah, that's kind of my one of my big messages with the book I'm writing is like, I know when you're in the thick of it, it just sucks and you don't think anything will ever get better, but it will it will initiate change in your life and you'll be stronger and you know, we can move on to other things. And um, but I appreciate you saying like kind of the timeline because I, you know, I still uh, and this is a great segue to coronavirus, you know, I'm still not as strong as I'd like to be. You know, I have Epstein-Barr flare up in the winter that I've been talking about, although not as bad as last winter. Last year, I started to get asthma here in Arizona in the spring and I'm getting it again, but also not quite as bad. I'm kind of getting it somewhat managed, but as you know, it's, it's very emotional when things start coming back and then this Corona is happening and like, I have been worried too. I feel like I'm a better host, right? Cause I'm a little weaker. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's a big question I we've gotten is what if I have Lyme? What if I have Hashimoto's? Like, am I at greater risk? What's your opinion? Well, I want to tell you that there is something called molecular mimicry. Molecular mimicry occurs when the there's permeability within the gut lining. So our junctions within the gut should be tight, tight, tight. For reasons such as antibiotics, stress, diet, you name it, those junctions can open. When those junctions open, food, proteins, bacteria, things get through and then come into the bloodstream and the body's like, whoa, shh, I got to kill it. So anti anti antibodies are made to go after those uh, bits of food or bacteria, whatever it is. And then somehow there's a confusion that occurs. And then that antibody starts moving around the body, but then getting confused and attacking the thyroid, attacking the colon, causing like Crohn's disease, attacking the skin and you get psoriasis. So that's called molecular mimicry. So for people who, you know, have Hashimoto's and it's an antibody, you know, they, we check the antibody titers for that. It can have, it could have occurred because of molecular mimicry and not so much just a fluke or a family thing, whatnot. So, you know, sometimes uh, the people who I study with are very, and they've had, you know, they've had a lot of people that they've treated. They actually have seen that people's antibody levels drop down and they can almost come off of their thyroid supplement um, by virtue of just healing, healing the gut. So mm -hmm. in functional medicine, really, it's all about the gut. That's where we go. We have to start somewhere, you know, and we start with managing the gut. 
Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Well, you mentioned earlier that, that most of the immune system is in the gut, and frankly, let's be honest, like most everyone has a gut problem. You know, people, some people in our community, they're doing a lot of the good eating, but they have these underlying infections and stuff, so their gut isn't still quite right. And right. Then and, the and main Dana, public, they just all eat crappy. <laughs> so. Yeah. And for Dana, her saying she, with SIBO. Yeah, she had SIBO, yeah. SIBO is, is exactly a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, and that occurs. Maybe you're not making enough pancreatic enzymes. Maybe you've been on Prilosec or omeprazole or any of these anti-acid medicines that actually are, are problematic long-term. I mean, every, everything has a purpose, but it's when it just continues on or, you know, you, we write prescriptions for one thing and then that causes another problem. So then we say, okay, we'll take this on top of that one. You know, it, it's, it's unfortunate. It really is. So I, I sound like you're saying start with the gut with like boosting your body. And if you have chronic illness in this time of Corona, is that a good summary? It, it is a good thing. And then just working with your immune system, using things that really can boost your immune system. And some of it is as simple as sleeping and staying well hydrated. Um, some of the best things you can do is vitamin C, vitamin A, vitamin D3, those kind of things. And keeping up uh, foods that are great for antioxidant um, pro producing. And if you just go to Healthline, Healthline has, which is a website, healthline.com, they have a great list of foods to increase glutathione, and that's your major antioxidant. Other things that are out there, um, really very helpful uh, is andrographis for oh, yeah, you uh, mentioned assisting. That. Yes, yes. Um, I tried to help uh, some patients find it today. Every website I went at. <laughs> How come I'm the last one to learn about this? But it's the best antiviral. So that might also help you, Bridget, um, protect yourself with the relapse of the Epstein-Barr. It'll, it'll come back. I know it will. But uh, for right now, it's, you know, the simple things, you know, and we can't, we can't stress enough really good hand washing. Yeah. Because I, because I posted on my Instagram, the importance of the fingers. So we get the soap and we're doing this, right? It's not the palms that are the problem. It's the fingers, the thumb in between here. Yeah. You know, think about it. If you've ever watched those shows and you watch the surgeons wash their hands, you know, they get into every piece and whatever, but it is, it's the fingers. Yeah. I've been definitely trying to do hand watching. We have like a, a little infographic we're going to come out with, but I think I was trying to think about like, why do we do that? And I think your hands kind of feel clean when the palms are clean, but that doesn't mean, yeah, like it's lurking. Well, think about else. it. You know, you got little ridges, you know, for your nails and little places things can yeah. hide. Yeah. You know, I, I'm all about trying to be as super, you know, careful about the products you use. But, you know, at this point, sometimes you got to pull out those, you know, Lysol wipes and really disinfect your doorknobs and, you know, things that we touch all the time, the light switches, the toilet flusher. Yeah. I think it's important to wash all the handles in your house. You can also do like, um, cup of vinegar, cup of water, and like 30 drops of on guard essential oil, or I've been talking about purify essential oil. So you can make your own stuff too, just kind of do a little research. Right. right I right, shared right. a blog here. I don't know if you saw it, Cindy, but I wrote a blog two days ago on natural supplements for coronavirus. And we're going to do, we have a lot more coming. Um, you know, it's a, it's a legitimate crisis going on now. And I think oh, people's attentions are shifted there, which is makes sense. Um, and I'm just like, let's use this as an opportunity for learning about, you know, supporting our health Our, you know, if you've gotten a little slack on your cooking, you've gotten slack on your hydration or getting to bed on time. I've been like way better about sugar lately. It's such an immune zapper. Um, and I've just been researching. I'm like taking all this magnesium. I didn't even know it was good for asthma. I, ha I sell magnesium, but I just, you know, I'm not as good about taking it. It's helping me a lot. 
Well, you so. know what else is good? Um, NAC, NAC, uh, N-acetyl, yeah. um, N-acetyl coat. Cysteine. Oh my God. And acetylcysteine? Yeah. Cysteine. Yeah. <laughs> there's too many. Choline, cysteine. Yeah. There's too many of them. But yeah. we always go by acronyms and then we get confused. Like, oh my God, what does that actually mean? <laughs> yeah. And we just sell straight glutathione. And I have some um, study in the article about, yeah, glutathione. The tests, the studies were done at pretty high doses, but glutathione does increase immune activity. Um, so I have a bunch of references and stuff in there because I think, you know, well, the NIH and like FDA are like, there's nothing that works. Like just wash your hands. That's not really true, but I don't think there's one solution for antiviral either. Like there's a lot, like one of my friends is super into selenium right now. I feel like I'm the only one like preaching about fish oil and magnesium, but I really believe in it. Um, and you know, there's other things I've researched, so it's okay. Like if you can't get your hands on a certain thing, like the right. anthrograft right. there are right. other options out there. Um, spirulina, spirulina oh. is another one. So is that just generally cause it's like alkalizing or what, what's the mechanism there? I don't, I don't know that. Okay. I don't know that. I'll let, maybe I'll look into it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Just, and I, you know, when, as I talked to the spirologist on Monday, like don't be going all yes. up in the antiviral herb if you're not sick, like, yeah, wait, save that, save the big guns for when you need them, but vitamin right. C and a vitamin A, like you mentioned, those things can all yep. be taken yep. safely. Elder, elderberry is a big one. Yeah, elderberry, there's been some studies on one species of elderberry and coronaviruses. I don't think it's the same species you usually, usually see here in our stores, but I think there's still like benefit for well, sure. Any, so. Anything that can heighten, but you know, again, you don't want to over heighten. So yeah. you know, back to your question that I didn't answer, you're talking about people who have underlying issues, underlying issues that are not flaring and your body's taken care of, or you're very much in balance, you're doing all the stuff, does not excessively raise a risk. I think when you're dealing with people who are very ill, um, you know, with active disease, uh, cancers, HIV, you know, these kind of things, we're really, really worried. If you have somebody that has metabolic syndrome, out of control blood sugars, you know, they're, they're obese, very obese and, you know, they're hypertensive and they've got underlying heart issues. That's where the concern comes about because remember, this is a respiratory infection. And if it gets into the body, it is housing in the lung. You can end up with a really bad type of uh, a pneumonia, you know, houses in there. And if you already are compromised because you have severe, say, asthma, um, and it's not easily controlled, you know, or you, you people who have uh, congestive heart failure and they have, that's mm -hmm. not controlled and they have excess fluid in their lungs. There were all those kind of things, but the vast majority of people, you know, more people die in around the world from influenza and people are forgetting that. That's, that's really important. The problem is the hype and, you know, the spread of this virus is getting people quite, quite alarmed. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's a good point. Like there's the risk level of like you're 80 and you have COPD. That's a much higher risk level than, you know, me and Dana, like I'm 45, I've got this, but I also eat really well and I make a lot of good decisions. So, um, you know, it's like, you know, there, I, I do think if you know you're immune compromised, to be extra careful and, and why don't we do that anyways? Why don't we take extra support of our health anyways? Um, but right, I don't right. think like our fatality risk is as high nearly no, as somebody no. who's elderly. So mostly in our age group, that very low rate. Right, yeah. right. It seems to not, I mean, they're looking at children now and seeing, you know, the impact on them. Cause in the beginning we heard young and old, but I think the vast majority of the people that are really, really sick or have died are either very compromised or they're much older. Yeah. And of course yeah. your immune system is not the way it is when you're younger. And it's funny because they gave the cutoff and, and statistics, you know, under 50, 
percent risk, yeah. and then they were over fifty, and then over sixty, and God forbid you're over seventy because you just might as well start digging a hole. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and that's why I said, like, some people I think are taking it so blasé, but I share, you know, my parents are in their 70s. My mom just had a transient stroke, and I'm not going to go to a conference, but I mean, now they're con con canceling them, but they weren't even a couple weeks ago. Um, and uh, I was like, I'm not going to risk, like, being around her, not knowing I'm infected, it, you know, so sometimes it's yeah. more about, like, just who are you around? Right, and making those those decisions. I've got a big thing coming up I got a new grandbaby coming in a few weeks Aww. and I'm like oh my gosh should I just start walking to Maryland like right now because by the time the baby comes I'll probably make it there you know from Massachusetts to Maryland I'm just you know what do I do do I get on a plane and I'm thinking you know you can incubate this for quite some time before but then which I have not found the answer is how many days prior to symptoms occurring are you contagious? Because we do know, you know, yeah. they're all saying, oh, incubation time, you know, you've got to like hibernate for two weeks. But if you, if you pick it up on Tuesday and you don't get symptoms till Friday, what happened on Thursday when you were, you know, with your grandchildren or you were working in a daycare or you were working in the nursing home with older people. No one has really said that of all the things that I've either read or listened to. No one said that. Well, I think that it's a little unknown. First they were saying, you know, two to 14 days, but then they had a confirmed case of 19 days. And then somebody else told me it was 20 some days they've seen a case. So I need to find out a little more, but it is a long period. And even though it seems a little over dramatic, I think it's actually better that we do cancel these events and stuff when we're all kind of like mostly well, then to be let it keep going and nobody knows they're sick. And then they just went to some huge concert. Um, so I think oh, it is no, better. I mean, yeah, okay. it is a so, long period. So you know what's um, getting crazy sold uh, in grocery stores hmm. um, outside of toilet paper? Uh, well, hand sanitizer. Dried, well, that too. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> but food wise, dried beans. Well, that's good. Get yeah, people eating some fiber. That's good. Yeah, good think for about that. Dad. Well, because they store for a long time. Yeah, I know how to cook dried beans. Maybe I should do a little video on how to cook from dried beans. Oh, there that's you go. It's a good go. skill to learn. There we go. We'll get all home steady. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> get out that crock pot, honest to God. Yeah, but those are the things that we have to think about. But unfortunately, I'm thinking also without the fresh produce, uh, you know, it's... Well, the spirulina you mentioned. We have a greens powder I'm touting. It just is coming out like this week. And I'm like, have that. It's so kind of alkalizing and stores well. Um, Dana, did we answer your questions about overstimulating the immune system? I think, I think we did a bit. Did we talk about, I thought we did talk a little bit about um, just kind of using what you need at the time. Um, I think that is a concern people are asking about like, well, if I boost my immune system, then am I gonna overreact to the coronavirus? I, I don't really think that's quite how it works. And I've mm -hmm. just been, yeah, encouraging people to also do a lot of anti-inflammatory stuff. Cause not, and again, like people like you and I aren't really at high risk for this, but the inflammatory stuff in your lungs, you know, if you're worried about, oh, am I overstimulating? We'll just also work on inflammation. And you talked about that too. A lot of things that linger are these inflammatory things. So a lot of us with chronic illness, we just need to just continually lower, lower inflammation. I know. It's a work in progress. It really, yeah. it really is. And, and I think the worst thing you can do is get to the point where you're so stressed and you're so worried that that's going to deplete your immunity as well. Yeah. Yeah. Keep it in stride. Well, Cindy, thank you for letting me keep you so long. This was a great conversation. It was awesome. Yeah. yeah. And I've people got your can... website here in the, in the notes. And oh, then wonderful. If people want to tune into your show, just search living with Lyme pretty much on your podcast. Yep. Living with Lyme.us because okay. uh, there's a few people and I have a lot of videos that will go out in the YouTube channel. Um, come later spring, summer, um, which are fun because, you know, you can hear me, 
but you have no idea that I'm making all kinds of faces behind <laughs> in the screen. <laughs> I know it's easier actually to do interviews with no camera because it lets you really like focus on the content. Uh, but some people like to see, you know. Well, who see is behind learn. that voice, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks again. If you if you thanks, have Bridget. questions for Cindy, you can reach out to her through her website. It sounds like she's seeing clients locally. And yeah, thanks for sharing with us. I'm always awesome. up to learn yeah. about Lyme. Yeah, for anybody that is local, um, you know, hopefully by April we'll be open. We have our farm for Red Sauna and our farm for Red Mad. And nice. we have massage and craniosacral and we have therapy and some energy healing. Gosh, we should be all healthy by then. It sounds great. It sounds like my kind of place. Okay, well, and thanks to everyone who is Thank live you. with us. We appreciate it. Um, I actually will be on Monday morning at, at 9 a.m. Pacific with a virologist. So people want to come over and talk about coronavirus and stuff. Um, and then I think Thursday we're back on talking about thyroid. So it's coming good. up. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye.